The triumph of democracy, a more restricted matter than the mass democracies of today, but nevertheless a dramatic change from tyranny, coincided with the triumph of the Athens of Pericles. Pericles was not a tyrant, but a leader chosen by the Athenian citizens as their representative. He led Athens through a period of reconstruction after the wars with the Persians, wars which had left Athens in ruins, but finally rid of its great enemy and at the head of a league of Greek city-states. The mid-5th century BC was the period of Athens' greatest influence, not only on the Greek world at that time, but on subsequent history. The most impressive and evocative monument to that influence is the Acropolis, the citadel which still dominates Athens. Pericles used the resources, or some contemporaries argued abused them, to rebuild the Acropolis and crown it with the Parthenon. The bold simplicity of the building, with its strictly harmonized repetition of the most basic geometric shapes, has had an unparalleled influence on the architecture of the world. The creators of the Parthenon, including the sculptor Phidias and the architect Ictinos, adapted the traditional temple form but refined it. They created an impression of subtlety and lightness despite the scale of the building and the massiveness of its marble surface. The sculptural decorations employed the skills of hundreds of craftsmen and set a new standard in art. It took less than a decade to erect this monument to Athenian pride. It was built on the ruins of a temple destroyed by the Persians and in part glorified the victory of the Greeks over their greatest enemy. But to their subsequent cost, the Athenians took more than their share of the benefits of Persian defeat. At home they may have been democratic, but to their fellow Greeks, such as the Corinthians and Spartans, they appeared arrogant and domineering. They felt that the protection of their founding goddess, Athena, had given them a special status. This special relationship was celebrated in a procession to honor the goddess. Today, the Parthenon is most admired for the exquisite harmony of its architecture and for the refinement of its friezes. But to the ancient Athenians, it was admired for something rather different, what lay inside the temple. And that was a statue of Athena nearly 40 feet high. That's only five feet below the ceiling as we look at it today. A statue armed, covered with gold, in all its dress from head to foot, the skin ivory with monsters on its helmet and a great serpent by its side. To us, that would seem garish, grandiose and unrestrained. But that was the core of the building. And if you put yourself in the position of uh, an ancient Athenian, perhaps coming from the Panathenaic procession, in the broad daylight, the blue skies and dazzling light of an Attic August, and then going inside that building, we can imagine what it felt like to see that statue as the eyes became accustomed to the gloom and saw the glitter of the gold, the jeweled eyes reflected in the pool below the statue. The effect must have been overwhelming. We can only imagine the impact created by the goddess and her surroundings. Our attempts to reconstruct the statue's appearance, like this one from the 19th century, can merely hint at the experience of seeing it in its dramatic context. But it does remind us how vivid, how colourful Greek art must have been in classical times. Bleached by the centuries and sterilised by the surroundings of the museum, the reliefs of the Parthenon frieze appear cool and restrained. But originally they would have been brightly coloured and even more lifelike than they are now. Their depiction of the Panathenaic procession would have been still more convincing, art and nature coming closer together than ever before. The frieze is generally regarded as representing the high point in the classical style. Composition is still rather formal, almost mechanical, but it's enlivened by a great many realistic details of gesture and posture. Figures are perhaps rather unemotional, but highly idealized. The whole thing seems to represent a, a balance between that Greek preoccupation with composition, proportion, and a growing sense of realism. The illusion of reality is created even more impressively in the massive sculptures of the pediments, the gables at each end of the building. What seems to happen is that they were creating, so far as they could, 
more successful images of man by varying the representation of details. There was, as it were, a sort of natural selection of forms, and the forms that were eventually adopted naturally tended to be the more realistic ones. Add to it, remember, the colouring of the hair and the eyes, which would add to this realistic effect. And as soon as they succeeded in understanding how the human figure worked, that it was not simply an assemblage of patterns and volumes, they moved very rapidly to the point at which they could create a human figure in two dimensions or in three dimensions, which realistically portrayed quite subtle poses, postures, and actions. This was the major breakthrough. This is the thing which marked out Greek art from that of all contemporary cultures. This, at least in sculpture, was the point at which Greek art took off in a totally new direction and informed the whole Western tradition. The Athenian ascendancy did not survive the 5th century BC. Athenian democracy itself was always vulnerable. But Athenian culture, its philosophy, literature and drama, as much as its architecture, sculpture and painting, maintained a hold over the Greek and the Western imagination. 5th century Athens created a classical ideal against which all subsequent art could be measured. Here the sculptor has refocused the youthful ideal of the Kouros and the Parthenon frieze and the Getty bronze behind me onto the person of one man, Alexander the Great. What he's doing here is to appropriate the ideals of Periclean Athens and to show Alexander as the logical successor of those young men who fought in the Peloponnesian War for Athens' greater glory and who tried to establish her empire ever further and wider. No individual had ever achieved so much in the history of mankind, at least as far as the Greeks remembered it. No individual had incorporated within himself qualities which were so conspicuously heroic. So we have here an image that derives its authority from the past, the human, the heroic, the divine, but at the same time looks very definitely towards the future. <laughs> 